All right, you ready to do this? Let's do it. Let's give it a shot. Here we go. All right, welcome to the Yosemite Fit Show. I'm Brent DeShazer. I'm Steve Duggar. Thanks for joining us here on our very first episode. Before we begin, though, we're going to read a quick disclaimer to you, and I am going to actually read it, so apologies, but uh, this is our first time, so give us a little bit of a break here. Uh, so this show is for informational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or any kind of treatment. The activities that we discuss on here, physical or otherwise, may be too strenuous or dangerous for some people. So always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider uh, with any questions you might have regarding anything that we discuss here on the Yosemite Fit Show. The host, sponsors, and guests of the show are not responsible for any injuries, losses, damages, or liabilities that may arise from the use of any information discussed or presented on this show. Okay, legal stuff out of the way. <laughs> All right. So uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we've gotten several requests from people to do this. Um, we're both health and fitness uh, enthusiasts. Our goal with this show is to promote health, fitness, wellness, and longevity here in our community and to promote related businesses to both locals and visitors to the area. To start off with, I thought it'd be a good idea. You know, we can give some little brief bios of each of us, um, kind of who we are, what we're doing with health and fitness, you know, what our background is there. I'm gonna talk about, you know, any personal routines that we do as well. Sure, sure. So I'll let you go first if you wanna do that. Gosh, okay. <laughs> you got uh, two minutes. Yeah, gosh, okay, let's see. Consolidate two minutes. I get <laughs> long-winded on things, but. Um, I've, I've pretty much always been active. Um, I grew up playing a variety of sports and got real focused into the aquatics, swimming and water polo, um, all the way through college. And then afterwards, uh, kind of took a little bit of a break and then got re-inspired to start pursuing, uh, I was introduced to CrossFit about 2006 ish, I want to say. And that kind of reinvigorated my enthusiasm and like really getting excited about things because I had gotten way out of water polo shoes, <laughs> right? Like not even close. And and so I got real enthusiastic about it again. Got deep into that, and then it, that kind of led to um, a little bit of a, a branch. I was doing um, a lot of training with an organization called Jim Jones in Salt Lake, okay. and uh, CrossFit. Those were two really really big pieces of my whole training philosophy and stuff. And then through CrossFit got into powerlifting and Olympic lifting and those kinds of things. And then luckily by chance had a client uh, that I coached quite a bit, um, Scott Carey, who introduced me to Dr. Plumer at UC Irvine, okay. the sports medicine and kind of got involved in there and stuff and training, training some of those athletes and whatnot. So it's just been kind of ever, you know, an ongoing thing ever since then. And just love being in the gym. I, right. Like on any chance I get off days, I'm, you know, <laughs> not if I'm, even if I'm not coaching, I'm in there. And feels, just, just feels fun. great, you yeah. know, helps mental and physical both. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's awesome. You know, you're quite a resource to have here in this community. So I think I ran across you, uh, from maybe your Facebook page or something like that, where, uh, you know, you've been talking about, uh, or no, um, one of the locals that I follow talked about, tr uh, doing some training with you. Okay. So I looked you up, um, and that's kind of how I, I found you and it's like, Hey, this guy, I, I like what he's saying here. So, um, and we met few weeks ago, yep. got together and had, had lunch and everything and decided to uh, do this together. So that's kind of how we came together on that. But yeah, great background. I know you've done a lot of training and done some certified personal trainer stuff in your past and everything. So yeah, that's like I said, a great resource. I am a little different. <laughs> uh, were you done? Yeah. Okay. Just making sure. Um, I'm a little different. I'm kind of a health and fitness enthusiast. So I was a heavy kid for, for quite a bit. Um, but then I got into martial arts when I was younger and weightlifting and um, some of those types of things, you know, slimmed down, got a lot healthier, but, you know, kind of yo-yoed back and forth over my life. I mean, I'm coming up on 54 years old right now. So you look like you're about 27. <laughs> no. no, I'll be, I'll be 44 in June. Okay. Yeah. But you still, I, I got a few years on you here. Yeah. So about 10, it sounds like. Um, yeah. And so as we're, you know, as I've gotten older, it's become 
a lot more important. I mean, I want to live a healthy life, have a, a nice longevity, but, you know, a good health span as well. I don't want to uh, live the last 20 years of my life debilitated or anything. So I've done things. I've done long distance cycling, you know, 500 plus mile trips, bike across Kansas. A couple of years ago, my partner and I, we hiked the Camino de Santiago in Spain, which we did 160 miles of that. I like doing big crazy fun stuff like that. Uh, we're actually um, filming this in my home gym. It's pretty extensive, got weightlifting, boxing, cardio. I'm out here six to seven days a week doing something. You know, I'm a big believer in, you know, staying fit, staying healthy and active. But I also do some longevity, health and wellness things besides exercise, sauna and cold plunge, um, which are really popular, but have had a lot of personal benefits for me. I've really, really felt the effects and improvements to cardiovascular and, you know, also just body composition. You know, I generally, I've tried every diet imaginable. I think, you know, I've done keto for couple of years and had good success with it. Um, it just wasn't really sustainable for me much longer than that. I was vegetarian for a year Sorry. and I, 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 <laughs> I don't like vegetables. And what's more, they don't really like me either. I roasted some uh, broccoli in the oven the other night on some parchment paper, which is supposed to be fireproof. You can see this on my Facebook page. I pulled it out and the oh, parchment paper was on fire, you know? Yeah. yeah. Again, vegetables, That's I, I'm not... That's yeah, I, that's the way I, I got to feel, <laughs> feel about it too. But, you know, I do try to get nutrition, you know, so I kind of follow the four pillars of health, exercise, uh, nutrition. I don't want to say diet. That's kind of got a bad connotation, but nutrition, sleep and stress are, you know, kind of the four pillars of, of health that a lot of the uh, professional scientists and fitness enthusiasts, you know, Dr. Pita Tia, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, Andrew Huberman, you know, are some, you know, very popular and have a lots of great information out there. And so I try and follow and take that in. But my goal is, you know, health and longevity at this point in my life. That's a little bit of my background. I, again, I'm exercising six or seven days a week, but to also trying to eat, you know, a reasonable, you know, sustainable diet. I'm not a vegetarian anymore. I do take a, just a couple of supplements. I don't know, you know, I believe in getting like whole foods as much as possible, right? Absolutely. You know, it's best for our nutrition. You never know what kind of micronutrients are there. I mean, that's kind of why I was roasting broccoli the other night, <laughs> but I do a little bit of supplements as well. For, I take creatine mm -hmm. uh, monohydrate, which helps with, you know, muscle fullness and strength. It's, it's a bit of a performance boost. It's really cheap, easy to get. You know, so yeah, that's yeah. one thing that I do. I'm a huge fan of creatine too. I, I do a, a crealkaline just because um, I don't, you know, I take like pills basically. Okay. You know, the crealkaline, I, I've really enjoyed doing that method uh, or style of creatine, but creatine is like one of the most beneficial over the counter supplements that you can get. Um, well studied, well documented. Right. There's tremendous benefit, not only muscularly, but neurologically and, and all sorts of stuff. So like creatine is definitely top of the list for a supplement. It's, it's been proven safe and effective so many times over yeah. and over. Now, one thing I remember, so I, I think a typical dose is like five grams, five grams a yeah. day. And so you did mention the mental benefits. I, I saw a recent thing that came out where the mental benefits were really at, in like the 20 gram range. Oh, right. Have you seen that before? You know, I, I haven't dug too deep into it because like I would say the creatine for the muscular benefit really. Right. And that's the creocaline, the, the, the research that I saw was it like had less water retention. So it wasn't getting that kind of bloaty type kind of feelings and stuff. And so, and this was like, you could take it just on workout days, okay. but I typically do it every day. And then I kind of like stumbled across and saw there was some neuro benefits and I was like, oh, okay, cool. I didn't dive deeper into what the effective dosage range was for that neurological benefit. I just ran across it in a, in a study the other day that was talking about where they, they thought the, you know, the real benefit to that, um, you know, was in like the 20 gram okay. range, you know, which used to be, they tell you, you know, you were supposed to do like 20 grams a day for like three days or something. Yeah. Or something. Period. Right. Yeah. And I think they've kind of gotten away from that. Now you can just start out taking five grams a day, but it is a great supplement. I also do like a multivitamin every day yep. and a little vitamin 
vitamin D. Yep. And yeah, and you know, other thing I'll, I'll mention is I started doing a testosterone replacement therapy uh, back in October. It's something that I explored quite a bit. I'm doing it under medical supervision, but it has really been amazing to me the the difference it's made you know, in, in how I feel oh, and my yeah. workout recovery, especially, yeah. you know, it's not like a steroid type dose or anything. It's just kind of returning you to the baseline, the level. And again, I'm doing it under medical care. I wouldn't recommend it any other way. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, an actual physician uh, that I'm working with, but it, it's, I've been really pleased with it. So that's kind of the extent of the supplements or anything that I, I do. So yeah, so I do uh, creatine, as okay. we talked about. Um, I do a mag it's a uh, magnesium D three for sure, uh, fish oil. Okay, and I try to get pretty sizable dose of fish oil, especially for the, the omega threes. And, and I guess I forgot fish oil, but yeah, I think I do two grams a day on fish oil. I have to do the math. I, I got this There's super two concentrated pulp. thing that's like I think it's a gram of EPA. I want to say I'd have okay. to I'd have to check the label. And right. Label and again, I did a year you know a while back and dialed it in. Like okay, I need three capsules of this thing. So I do fish oil, creatine, magnesium D three, and I was kind of doing. I'm always I'm, I'm always curious about nootropics, right? And so, like, especially the 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 dopamine um, systems. And so, I haven't really gotten. I'm not taking anything right now, but it's always kind of in the back of my mind, looking at like possible you know supplements in that in that realm. But have you ever tried like a um, you know I know the one from uh, Joe Rogan's company is called Alpha Brain. You, know, you ever tried any of those? I, or I haven't tried his brand. Um, okay, I do. I've heard great thing. I've heard great things about. I think it's on it. Is uh, yeah, Joe on it. Thing. That's yeah. right. Heard great things about it. And looking at the ingredient list, you can kind of see like the the typical stress type um, adaptogens, really. So like you got ashwagandha, rhodiola, right? Um, ginseng, and then there's some arguments about like what type of ginseng, Siberian, whatever. But like, there's some pretty standardized, like well known or well documented adaptogens that help with stress, that help with like your, you know, they they kind of throw them under the nootropics kind of thing. And then, okay. And then there's a ton of stuff that that are real typical in just about any supplement you take. Like if you if you if you're gonna drink in drinks, a lot of times they throw that stuff in. There. <laughs> right. So, but along the, with a ton of sugar quite often. Yeah. Oh I, yeah. That's my most yeah. energy drinks. We we're I was just talking about this earlier with somebody else too. Like th those are not they are not good for you. Like right. bottom line. Right. It's not good for you. But I can totally understand like in a pinch, you know, but hey, everyone yeah. trying to avoid those as much as possible because they're they're pretty uh they're pretty addictive too. Oh, know, like yeah, uh, it's coming off that stuff. It's <laughs> tough. But, but yeah, so the, the I have a hard enough time just with my morning coffee trying to give it right? up. So yes. yeah, so yeah, so the so just kind of recap the creatine, um, magnesium. I'm a huge, huge fan of magnesium. Uh, D three and uh, fish oil is kind of the the core of of what I'm taking right now. Okay, and so I've taken magnesium as well, and also. Oh, sorry. And the multivitamin. And the multivitamin. So, uh, yeah, I am a big fan of magnesium as well. I've, I've taken it, um, a lot of times I take it as kind of a response if I'm feeling like extra sore or, you know, a little dehydrated or something like that. Uh, magnesium is one of those things. And we buy tubes of, you know, the powder. You get like 30 or 60 of them from Amazon or wherever. And they're kind of electrolyte drink with uh, a magnesium focus. I think mag -Ease or something like that okay. is the one that we've used quite a bit. You know, if you read about magnesium, it's involved in so many of our bodily products processes and electrolytes in general. I mean, the same yeah. with sodium and potassium. Yeah. I was, you know. was going to bring that up too. One thing I ran into was I was for a while, you know, you're supposed to drink plenty of water, right? But I was drinking way too much. Yeah, that'll dilute those electrolytes. That's exactly what was happening yeah. to me. And so I've had to scale back and really pay attention to how much water I drink. I'm actually feeling a little better from pulling back a little bit. And I think I'm just not diluting electrolytes out of my, on my stream so much. Always do your own experimentations and check with a doctor on yeah. all this stuff, yeah, of course. Yeah. But, um, you know, this is just <laughs> anecdotal for both of us. Yes, totally anecdotal because some of my philosophy on some of this stuff is more, I guess you could call it French. It is it's not, not mainstream. Like I'm a huge advocate for a relatively high salt sodium intake. Okay. When I wake up, the first thing I do is I drink salt 
Oh, like that. That's the first thing I do before coffee, before anything. Just else. water and salt. Do you ever have like lemon or anything? I, I typically just some iodized salt and there you down go. Hatch, All right. Right? And, and um, that pays huge. Like it makes a huge difference in my day, especially. Huberman had a little bit of an impact on me. He was talking about like kind of delaying coffee intake or caffeine intake for like an hour. Yeah. I think he said 90 minutes or 90 minutes. Something, something okay. like that. It was like 60, 90 I'll give him an hour. Right? <laughs> I yeah, I know. I could go. It's like, it feels like eternity first thing in the morning. But, <laughs> but yeah, I'm trying to delay that a little bit because there's some, you know, kind of, there's some mechanisms involved in, in the caffeine having like a, a, a crash effect. If you don't wait that, that time period. Okay. It's kind of rattling around a little bit. Great. I can't remember exactly what he said, but we'll, uh, we'll, I'll, I'll find some of this information. We are, I am going to do a show notes for these shows. Um, we'll, that'll have detailed information and links that you can go out and research some of this yourself. Perfect. So yeah. just, just so everybody knows. Yeah. So first thing I do is like, uh, salt or an electrolyte little packet, um, LMNT, um, Yep, I've heard of that one as well. It is very popular. Very these days. popular. It's a little pricey. I like Rob Wolf, and and he was really instrumental in CrossFit in the early days. So he's I've always kind of followed him around, and um, so like Element T or or just straight salt and water first thing okay. pays a huge huge difference for me because I in my day day to day job if I don't constantly stay hydrated it it can be pretty severe for me. I, I had heat stroke many years ago and it, the heat still bothers me. So wow, I okay. yeah. overheated and right. that, I gotta be mindful of make sure I'm hydrated and stuff. Sure. So. Yeah. All right. Well, this is a great discussion and I love that we went uh, kind of off script a little bit, we did have a couple of topics that uh, I figured we'd bring up, you know, and so let's talk a little bit new year's resolutions yeah. or lack thereof. So we are recording this at the end of February now, right? So I'm assuming that most of you out there who have set New Year's resolutions no longer have New Year's resolutions. Uh, you know, they show that a huge percentage of people, you know, the second Friday of January is called Quitter's Day. And it's for a reason most people quit their New Year's resolutions um, by then. It's just, it's become the norm in our society. So everybody, I'm going to eat better. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to quit, you know, drinking alcohol, um, you know, whatever, you know, we're doing health-wise and everything. And then it goes down quick. So it's just become so normal and everything. So maybe that's you. Maybe Maybe you've gotten off track a little bit. Um, so we're going to discuss some maybe strategies to get back on track and more importantly, stay on track, you know, for the rest of the year. So let's kind of commit to, you know, restarting if you've given up right now. So it's never too late to, to start. One thing that's always been really helpful for me is having somebody that I'm accountable for. Now that can be a trainer or just a, a workout partner or, you know, a, a spouse or other loved one. Um, but, you know, I, I, that's always given really good benefits for me. So yeah. if you know you got to be somewhere and somebody else is counting on you, you, you tend to show up. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Accountability is a huge, huge piece. And honestly, like a, a lot of people know what they should do. Right. Right. Like you, you have a general idea. I mean, I should eat this, should eat that, do this, do that, exercise, walk and all these things. Like it's not revolutionary to say like you should you should move and you should eat healthy right, right? and and you can get lost in the weeds of those things but but generally speaking i would say most people kind of know like yeah but the accountability piece is is a really really big piece and hiring a personal trainer or a partner or you know sometimes that can get a little dicey too because the, the roles and relationships and stuff and making your, per, you know, your, your partner feel <laughs> right. like might not be, may not be the best idea, but hmm. yeah, that could get, that's never interesting. <laughs> yeah, right. Good point. Yeah. So think about that. If you're looking for an accountability partner. Yeah. Um, so do you know anybody who does personal training? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this guy here. So, but I mean, we got lots of great ones in, in our, our area, but uh, you obviously do personal training. And, I and honestly, you know, in just addition to just to the accountability, I mean, if you're paying up for it, chances are you're yeah. more likely to show up. Yeah. And there's, there's a strong argument for, you know, outsourcing that, paying somebody to help keep you accountable, because that's also a, an accountability piece. Sure. I'm not paying this person, you know, X number of dollars. And sometimes it's a lot. Sometimes... <laughs> Um, and you want to maximize that as much as possible. And so you're, you know, that's already kind of a built in accountability in and of itself, but sure. having somebody to call you out, right? You know, like, Hey, where are you? What's going on? What'd you do? The other thing I'll, I'll add to accountability too, is just tracking. 
Okay. Right? Like Great. just track it. Sure. There's been business studies and leadership studies and stuff. And and I think it was Druckenmiller who said, like, if you don't track it, you don't care. Right? <laughs> or, I, you know, Alex Ramazzi, I know he said that, but but Druckenmiller's like, if you, if you don't track something, like you, you really can't make informed decisions of where you are, where you're going, where you've been. Okay. So just the act of tracking it down. And one of the first things I'll have so, uh, a client do is, as especially trying to dial in like the nutrition piece is to just write it down. Excellent. Don't weigh it. Don't measure it. I don't care. <laughs> write down just, everything. Just write goes down. Goes in your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Just write down what it was. And then we'll kind of build on that. I kind of see two, a, a split with a lot of people that I train over the, the years and some people it's got to be a gradual process. Okay. And so we'll start with just like, just write it down Sure. and we'll, we'll build from there. And because weighing and measuring your food can be just as neurotic. As, <laughs> oh yeah. You know, that can get away from you and, and, you know, compulsion and all these other things can come along with that. So I have to be a little bit careful, like, okay, how's your relationship with food and, and these things. But like just tracking, just starting to write it down, just pay attention. And just by paying attention, that can inform your decisions, you know, knowing, and that goes back kind of the accountability. So if I have somebody share with me their food journal, they know I'm looking at this thing and it's like, uh, maybe I should, maybe I won't eat the birthday cake. So just having that, uh, you know, just starting with writing, you know, tracking it, check it off. Jerry Seinfeld's a great example. You know, he said, like, <laughs> write one joke every single day. And, and, and you start building these check marks all on your calendar. And then all of a sudden, you, there, you there's a motivation to not break your streak. Yep. Right? You gamify it a little bit. And how many apps, you know, that we have on our phones and devices these days, I mean, it's all about streaks, whether it's language learning or, you know, diet or fitness or stuff. I mean, you get all these reminders. But, but there's something really powerful to it. Although I will point this out. Not a lot of people know this, but actually Jerry Seinfeld was asked about that story oh, really? was and it, said, was you never said it. Yeah. So <laughs> I hear classic. it contributed to that. <laughs> so, but it doesn't matter. Whoever said it was <laughs> yeah. brilliant yeah. because it works. That's so so it's definitely creating a, a streak and, and going with it. So never believe anything you read, yeah. man. You're right. <laughs> well, it's on the internet. It must be true, <laughs> yeah. Though, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but the tracking, I, I think it plays into the dopamine system really and, and how your brain rewards behavior. Sure. When you, when you have... When you're when you're doing the the thing that takes some discipline, because when you do it when you don't want to, I think Huberman actually talked about this. Was it Huberman or Jocko or somebody? It basically like when you when you do something you don't want to do, your your brain's gonna reward you for that. Right. And so like that's I think part of the I I would suspect it's part of the dopamine feedback loop and stuff. Like when you when you build a streak and when you when you start habitually doing things, especially especially when you don't want to do it going to build that discipline build that resiliency and then you get a streak going you're like oh man i don't know <laughs> I got 58 days going strong and then right. you don't want to want to let go and then you're handing that off to somebody you're an accountability partner or a trainer or whoever it is and they're looking at it and you know they're saying hey man what what happened over here right. what, what's going on and you got to kind of answer to that and so, you know, you, and, and that, that informs your decision in the moment a little bit too, because you know that you're going to send this over to somebody. You're like, oh man, I'm going to have to explain this. So <laughs> well, let's just not do that. Right. I have to explain it and stuff, but, <laughs> but yeah, just, just tracking and then, and then staying with that, that tracking. And then what I call, um, micro goals, like really small. I just talked to this gal in the gym this morning when I was in there and uh, she's like, man, it was so hard to get in here today. And I was like, Hey, sometimes just coming through the doors of W just right. show up. And so, yeah, that plays into um, what's called the minimum effective dose, right? Yeah. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So just whatever, I mean, there are, you know, I've had days where, you know, I've had workouts scheduled as low on energy or had a lot going on or anything, but I still come out here and I'll do one exercise, you know, yeah. just like show up, you know, build that resiliency, you know, build that mental fortitude to just get out there and do something, you know, keep that streak going quite often is I'll come out and I'm telling myself, I'm just going to do one, but I'll, you know, I'll get my sets in. You start feeling a little better. You're already here. You're already dressed. Might as well just do the workout. You know, it's only an extra half hour or however, you know, for two more exercises or whatever I'm doing that day. So not every workout has to be super high intensity, all out, um, you know, sometimes going for a walk or, or do whatever is going to reinforce and keep motivating you to keep doing this. Yeah. I always tell clients and people that I'm 
talking to or working with and stuff like you don't you don't race the car every day right right like that's a great metaphor I like that you're, you're not redlining every day and in fact that's actually going to be detrimental pretty pretty quick you want to have you want to structure things so that you're like you're going to push into the days where where you've got it and stuff and so so i usually will, will tell people like okay given all of the stress that you're dealing with in your life because your body can't distinguish between mental stress financial emotional you know you just have a fight with a spouse or, right. or something and and you're coming and you're trying to work out or you, you got you know money money challenges you're facing with it, it just all sorts of stuff in life can can go sideways on you and so it's like okay given all of that we're shooting for an eight okay right? like we're shooting for an eight out of ten given given where you're at right now right so and that takes some practice some getting used to to try to dial that in to figure out what what is an eight given given the thing and you kind of like learn to 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 adjust that and get your perceived exertion rating or something right. like that like kind of rpe right in. rate of perceived exertion yeah so something like that yeah. but, <laughs> but but your perception of like you know if you can have an honest conversation with yourself you're like okay that was a six or that was a seven and that was an eight that, okay that was a ten and that was that was everything i've got right you know, like i i just don't have any more to take the key thing is like if you're at an eight and that's just like 10 push-ups or five push-ups or one push-up right then that's a w yep that's a success like we we crushed it today got that's in got exactly, it done. exactly what we wanted to do so the the minimum effective dose or the micro goals and like being more process focused instead of outcome focused sure yep. right like it's hard it's difficult but there was this old commercial with blake griffin and he and he said like if you don't fall in love with the process you're never going to get there because it's the, it's the, um, when you, when you really set the outcome as the ultimate focus and the ultimate end goal, there's potential danger in that. In the fact that like you might do everything to script and life just doesn't have that outcome for you. Right. You know? And like, so you can do all the things and what you're doing is you're increasing the probability of reaching that outcome and that success, but it's not guaranteed. So, if, and, and so if you set everything on that, expectation expectations are great but they can also be very devastating if you, you work towards that and you don't it doesn't happen for whatever reason it's like the, you got to form up the process especially yeah. something with like health and wellness and stuff because this isn't what you know simon sinek is an infinite game yeah <laughs> right this is an infinite game so there is no there's no like great book by the way <laughs> yeah there's there's no hard line in this in, okay i was not fit and now i'm fit it just happens this like real gradual. I think Simon talks about like when you fall in love with somebody, mm -hmm. when you, there, there's no like, usually there's not like a real hard, like that, that was the moment when, you know, my love for this person changed. You know, right. I love them. It was like this gradual building. Getting to know them. So, yeah. So it's the whole process and the same with fitness. There's no real like line in the sand of not fit, fit. I mean, you can have some metrics, which are good, but they're just like, signposts right you know there's signposts on this journey of you know staying in the process staying in the in the now staying in the moment and you know it's just micro goals and so writing those things down you know how did i do today what did i eat today give it a score <laughs> and then you know keep building that until you've got a string and now you you're, you're gamifying it so to speak and right so the way i've seen that uh this talked about is systems versus goals yeah it gets described that way a lot you know and so you need both so you can it's not saying don't have goals at all no but you no, definitely no. it's like okay pick a goal whatever that might be so you want to squat you know two plates or you know whatever it might be well your system is you come to the gym <laughs> yeah him versus me you come to the gym three times a week five times a week whatever you're doing probably not squatting enough you know we can talk more about that in another show but however often you're doing it and then do what you can today get those workouts in for the week or whatever but um there's a process called a progressive overload you know and so you add a little weight the next time either the next workout or the next week or something like that that's your system so you're showing up and then you're progressively overloading, adding a little more weight. Um, and over time, you're going to hopefully reach that goal. Setting goals, smart goals, that's important as well. You got to know how to set your goals. And maybe we can talk about that at some point. Too, yeah, but. yeah. I, I definitely don't mean to say don't have any goals. Sure. Like, you want to be really, high, like in my opinion, focused on the process towards that goal. Because if you're just grinding, like you're going to run out of willpower. <laughs> 
to, if, if it's just grinding it out every day, oh, every yeah. time you come in, you're just grinding it, grinding it, grinding it, it will grind you down and you will have no, no you know, your, your willpower will start to falter. And so, you know, discipline will keep you going. And that discipline is in part of, in, from my estimation, is really like the, the, the process of the whole thing. Definitely want to have a target. Right. You, know, you want to be moving towards something the highest possible good, whether that's character development or, or squat development, right. you, know, you, you want to be moving towards, towards something uh, of value. And then, you know, really just fall in love with that process of, of learning about your body, what it's capable of doing. That kind of reminds me of something I usually remind my daughter quite often is like, you want to eat and work out because you want your body to do what it's capable of doing. Right. Right. And so it's not about, a certain weight on the scale. It's not necessarily about a number of plates on the bar because at the, at the end of the day, like those are all fun and good and stuff, but like, what is it, how, how's this going to transform and transfer to real life and like what you're really doing and like how you're, how you're actually living and conducting your life outside of the gym. So you want to, don't want to pull your back when you're out gardening or, you know, doing, you know, other yard work or whatever, you know, I mean, it, it, I mean, obviously there's sometimes some aesthetic, you know, advantages yeah, yeah, to, sure. to working out, but ultimately we, you know, we want to be healthy. We want to have, you know, good longevity and, and stay healthy as long as possible and mobile and active and, and all those good things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a great way of doing it. All right. I got one last thing I'll say about New Year's resolutions. I actually don't set New Year's resolutions myself or not like most people traditionally do on January 1st. So January 1st is not my New Year's. I set a personal New Year's, which is August 15th. And it was just I, I came up with this idea uh, at one time in my life. I was going through a lot of stuff and it's like I just put a stake in the ground and it happened to be August 15th years ago. I was going to ask you about that. So is August 15th like significant in some way or is that just like it, it was just i had a little wake up moment in my life that day i think and you know it's like all right what i'm going through i'm going to turn this around august 15th became my personal new year so that's when i set goals that's when i change passwords for all my accounts a lot of what we do you know around new year's or think about new year's you know that's my day and it's just mine and unless you happen to be listening to this on August 15th, like this idea and say, hey, it's mine too now. But, you know, today is what, March or no, February 28th, 29th, 29th. 29th. So, Deep, yeah. you know, this could be your personal new year, a good day that, you know, put a <laughs> That might be a ground. mistake to do it today because it only comes around so often. Aha, uh -huh. <laughs> clever. Uh, yeah, that's right. That'll be four years. All right. All right. So maybe, so maybe not start to, maybe tomorrow <laughs> day, or just say the 28th. So yeah, that's kind of my last tip for New Year's resolutions and avoiding, you know, the inevitable giving up on them. Pick your own New Year's. Start today. You know, whenever that is, that's your New Year's. Put it on your calendar. I mean, it's, it's marked on mine. And I know on that date every year, you know, I'm reevaluating goals. Like I said, I'm changing passwords on my accounts and things like that. I like to do that. My background's in IT security, so I do that pretty regularly. But yeah, that's my, my last little tip on that. Hopefully that was some great information. I'm going to talk a little bit kind of nutrition-wise here. We're going to talk about protein. And so I tend to eat a pretty high-protein diet. Protein is very important for, you know, building muscle, maintaining a lot of your bodily functions and everything. Like I said, I've done keto. Keto is not high-protein. Keto is high-fat very low carb. So you fill in with a little bit of protein, but I tend to eat pretty, you know, high protein. I'm usually shooting for, you know, 40, 50 grams of, of protein at least twice a day. And sometimes more I do, uh, you know, I have, I do protein shakes, but I try to get through, you know, eggs or, you know, other sources of, of, you know, natural protein, eggs, meat. Um, if you are vegan or vegetarian, you know, you have options like pea protein. I've got some protein powders that I, I really like to use a company called my protein. And then another one called pro mix, which I switched to recently. And the thing I like about both of those, as opposed to just picking a protein powder off the shelf somewhere, if you go into a lot of your GNCs or health places and everything, these, these big tubs of protein powder, they might tell you they've got so much protein in it, but quite often they don't actually have that in there. Yeah. So the thing that I've liked about my protein and ProMix is they were both independently tested and they actually have in them what they 
say on the label they have. So that's uh, always good. Yeah, I'll give you. Here's a prop. There's there's a bag of uh, Pro Mix. Um, I I like to get the unflavored um, and add it to whatever. But uh, this is the one that I've used, uh, been using recently. I uh, really like it a lot. Add it as needed to protein shakes or something if I feel like I'm just not getting a lot. But like I said, I am a big fan of protein and getting it from you know as many natural sources, you know, whole food sources as well. How does so? One thing I notice about lots of different. I've tried many many different protein powders over the years and stuff but um how do you find this like mixes does it is it clunky no it, does it mix really well um yeah i found that it mixes really smooth i've been really happy uh with both of those uh brands i just found um i used to use my protein a lot and it started getting more and more expensive um pro mix has, has been a little more reasonable price wise for me you know, and have all the same benefits that that I I got from the my protein. So, uh, yeah, it's smooth, not gritty, not clumpy. Now, the other thing I do, in addition to just adding this and making my own, um, is I use a product, and it's actually on my shirt here. But it's actually it's a, another powder called Huel. Um, I don't know if you've heard of that. It's kind of short for human fuel. Oh, but it's did not know that. Is supposed to be a complete food. So if you had enough servings of this in a day and you're just drinking these shakes with this stuff in it, it's supposed to be your complete nutrition profile. I don't know that I quite buy that. Um, you know, I, I think it's still good. I'm still a big fan of you know, whole foods. Yeah, <laughs> real food. I like eating, you know, so that's, that helps. Yeah. But I've been really happy with this. I use the uh, Huel Black, um, which is the higher protein version of the Huel. It actually has 40 grams of protein grams per scoops. serving. Yeah, it's two scoops, but I really like it. It comes in a ton of different flavors. However, one thing I will say about this is it's pretty gritty. It? <laughs> yeah, so the way I usually fix it, I, you know, it comes with a shaker, put it in the shaker, shake it up, put it in the fridge for a couple hours. So, you know, it's ready to go when I'm ready. And that helps a little bit with that texture, but it's still pretty gritty. But again, it's just a supplement. Um, it's not something, you know, that I, I use all the time, but I've been really happy with it. And uh, the t-shirts you get when you on your first order are amazing. I love these t-shirts. They fit great. They're soft. So yeah. I'm, I'm not sponsored by them by any means, at least not yet <laughs> uh, or anything, but it's just, it's a product I really, really like and have seen good results with. Um, so I like that a lot. So, you know, that's kind of my take. And I know, um, I'm assuming you are kind of an advocate for uh, yeah, yeah. I, reasonable to high protein. So, yes, I am an advocate for fairly high protein. Um, I did a little experiment on myself recently. Um, I, I had, uh, it was probably, it was about a year ago. It was about March of last year. Okay. And um, I had a, staph infection i had to get cut and um that was <laughs> very uncomfortable do not recommend <laughs> so, it. yeah yeah so but but in talking to my to my doctor we kind of he's actually an advocate which kind of struck me of uh carnival okay so he was kind of talking a little bit about it and then i had stumbled on to uh dr sean baker who's mm -hmm. a real big advocate for carnivore diet and so I figured I'm going to give it a go. Right. So I gave it, I, I kind of, now it wasn't like hardcore. I didn't do it properly, you know, like a hundred percent. Um, I gave myself like once a week to kind of let loose a little bit. And I have, a, and that typically for me means Reese's peanut butter cups. Okay. <laughs> Not a bad treat if you're going to break something. So like, uh, I was like, you know, on a, um, uh, treat day. Uh, I've kind of tried to move away from cheat day. Cause it's like, I'm going to treat myself a little bit, but anyway, so I was kind of, basically I did that for about, um, it was probably about nine months of that. And I felt great. So, I so felt real great. quick, great. give us the 30 second. What is the carnivore diet? I'm familiar with it, but there might be so, some people. Yeah, out there it's pretty simple. You know, if you're going to go pure carnivore diet, it is red meat, salt, and water. That's it. And we just lost all the vegetarian <laughs> <and eating laughs> yeah. listeners on our, in our yeah. audience. Yeah. yeah, just specifically ruminant meat. So like bison, elk, deer, and bovine cow. So because of the way they process grain or uh, grasses when they when they eat stuff, they typically have the best nutrient density in, in their meat. So just red meat, uh, essentially, and salt and water. That's it. All right. And um, I couldn't bring myself to do quite that <laughs> level. So I gave myself a, a once a week. And so I, I was using um, essentially ground beef um, 
pretty high fat content and would cook off some of the the fats a little bit, but uh, about a pound and a half a day. Wow. All right. That's a lot. <laughs> it was substantial. Um, but you had great results from it. I did. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I did. I felt great. I, I, you know, saw tremendous improvement in my body composition. It was very, very beneficial and probably going to go back to it. I, I've, I've been off of carnivore for a time and I was kind of debating using different strategies and whatnot. Um, another one that I've done in the past that was really, really great that I did was a zone diet, which oh, is 40% of your caloric needs from uh, carbohydrates, 30% of your calor calories from fat, 30% from protein. Okay. So 30% from protein is still relatively on the high side of the, you know, the USDA recommendations. So it's still relatively high. Carbs are reduced a little bit and fats like kind of elevated in the zone diet. And the whole idea is to like get your hormonal uh, profile kind of in the zone and okay. kind of balance and stuff. Like so, that. <laughs> yeah. And so I was, I, I've been kind of like floating with the zone thing right now. And I'm probably going to go back to carnivore to be honest. Okay. We're back maybe from technical difficulty number two. Maybe we can uh, finish off the show here. I want to mention just two things. Sorry, we got cut off there. Number one, for all you vegans and vegetarians that are still with us after the uh, nightmare that was the, the carnivore dis diet Carnivor. discussion, um, uh, Huel Black and, and the regular Huel as well, which is like 20 or 25 grams of protein, um, are both for, uh, vegan and vegetarian friendly. So they are made with pea protein, um, you know, and, and several other ingredients as well. Um, but they're they're completely uh, vegan and vegetarian safe. So if you're looking for a source for a lot of high quality protein, um, give Huel, check it out and, and see. Um, so the last things I really want to talk about with, uh, you know, before we talk about a couple of quick studies was, uh, another thing I like about protein is that it's, uh, it's very satiating, um, fills you up pretty quick versus carbs and fat. And then the other thing I like about it is what's called the thermic effect of food or TEF. And it's how many calories it takes to actually digest the food that you eat. And protein can be anywhere from 20 to 30%. You have, have a TEF of 20 to 30% on that. So it takes... All up to a third of the calories that you, um, you're actually consuming, it takes up to a third of them to actually uh, process and digest that food. So that's another, you know, whereas with carbs and fat, you're you're way less than 10% on both of those. So that's another nice thing about protein. It fills you up and, you know, it takes a lot of calories to actually digest it. Um, so if you eat 100, you know, calories worth of protein, um, chances are it's only, you know, 20, 75, maybe 70 uh, calories um, is all that your body's actually absorbing because, or, you know, that uh, that 25 or 30 ca uh, calories is going to actually digest that food that you're eating. Um, all right, so we want to talk about, uh, kind of wrap up with a couple of quick studies on protein. Um, you know, one thing you might've heard is, you know, protein, you can only, you know, use 20 grams at a time, you know, you don't need to get more than 20 grams of protein in any given meal, you know, and so that used to lead to, oh, well, you know, we have to, you know, like bodybuilders would eat six times a day, eight times a day or something like that, smaller meals. Um, and there's a recent study that came out that actually kind of debunked this a little bit. Now, there's a couple of specifics in there, um, but they actually did studies with people that had either they were given no protein or 25 grams of protein or 100 grams of protein in one meal. And what was interesting was they found that, you know, even after 12 hours, the people that got 100 grams were still, their body was still synthesizing and utilizing that protein. And it kind of went against the fact of, you know, it used to be, you know, more than 20 grams and your body's just going to dump the rest of that, store it or whatever. But they were actually finding that it was still being used in the bodily processes. Now, the caveat with this particular study was that it was done on milk protein. So again, sorry, vegans, um, but... Uh, it was done on milk protein, which is a type of protein, you know, has a pro type of protein called casein or casein protein versus like the whey um, types of protein. And it's a more slow digesting protein. So I think it still needs to be tested whether, you know, this is going to be effective if you're using other types of protein. So, yeah, well, we, I mean, we get whey protein from the, the milk as well. Too, right. So, but um, yeah, it was, it's kind of an interesting study because, you know, Previously, there's the argument was, like you said, meals every two to three hours spaced out, you know, five, six, four, five, six meals a day or something. But I mean, just kind of thinking off the top of your head, like evolutionarily, evolutionarily. Yeah, we'll go with that. Yeah. Um, 
or just thinking about, you know, paleolithic type type hunter gatherer societies, pre agriculture, they're probably going to go <laughs> a long time. You know, they're not, they're not four never, or five meals a day, seven days a week, right. you know, all year round and stuff. So I don't know if I'm totally surprised to see, like, hey, look, you know, intermittent fasting and having large, large amounts of protein, relatively speaking, in, uh, you know, one meal kind of makes sense when you when you kind of think about you know pre pre agriculture and pre domesticated animals and stuff or just kind of hunting there's going to be periods of time where the hunt's not very successful right so uh, sometimes it can be long periods of time where that happens yeah yeah and so then you're trying to fill in the gaps nutritionally with other things and you know by you know foraging for nuts and seeds and if you're depending on geographically where you're at maybe some uh, berries and things like that but but for the most part the primary diet is going to be wild game right. so not totally surprised about that but what was interesting is how long the elevated protein synthesis was after that meal and stuff so that is kind of interesting hopefully they'll do more studies related to this and try to test some other types of protein and see whether that you know that holds up but it was just you know again as somebody who's uh, pretty positive on a higher protein diet and again always check with your physician or other yeah. healthcare provider yeah. Um, yeah but it has been really beneficial and, and good for me for for a lot of those reasons it was a good study to kind of see and debunked a lot of what you know i had heard when i was you know younger and doing more bodybuilding type stuff yeah, um, and I think we were talking kind of off camera about it too. And I think, I think a lot of times some of these like protein studies, nutritional studies and stuff, like, especially when you're like isolating a particular micronutrient or macronutrient, sure. it's like, you know, the, the focus on the absolute minimum necessary for biological function, right. you know, and like for a long period of time, you know, the, the standard protocol would be, you know, get two grams of protein per body, you know, pound of body mass. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, has been argued back and forth. Is that too much? Is that too little? Is that are they, they talking about total weight minutes? or lean body mass? You know, the, yeah, 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 lots of variables. Yeah. There. So you can yeah, you can dissect that a lot. And then and then studies are like, you know, oh, you only need, you know, 1.2 grams per kilogram of body mass. Right. And it's like, okay, is that, you know, so so trying to figure out like the difference between absolute minimum necessary for biological function, um, optimal. Right, like what? What's the optimal range given your your you know the uh, circumstances? Are you are you bodybuilding? Or are you you know working at a bank? Right, you know, like so. And then then the extreme, like how how much is too like beyond <laughs> capacity yeah. going to cause damage? Right. So and that that becomes an ethical dilemma to test on humans. Right. No, you can't, yeah. you can't do that. I mean, other than the, you know, kind of like we talked about the Ronnie Coleman's and the Dorian Yates and the, you know, big guys like that, who, you know, test themselves. But uh, a lot of those guys do end up having some health issues, you know, later on and you yeah. never know what all is involved with that and other substances and everything. But uh, yeah, like anything, you know, your mileage may vary, dosage dependent, you know, try to be reasonable and, you know, work with your, you know, healthcare providers, trainers, you know, knowledgeable people who you know can notice how you and yourself listen to how you're feeling as well and adjust yeah and if and if you have access and opportunity then you know doing blood work regularly to see where your you know all these other markers are at, you know your your blood sugar levels and your you know the your kidney function levels and, and things like that like well you know if you have obviously if you have means and opportunity to do that you can kind of see but the default is going to be like absolutely go talk to your doctor about it before, especially if you have any pre-existing health conditions that like don't don't experiment if you have pre-existing stuff so excellent advice all right, all right. And then one more protein related study, uh, since we're on to that. Um, so we talked about a lot of the benefits and everything you might've seen a recent article or headline or whatever, uh, will too much protein damage your arteries? Um, so this was a study that came out. They seem to indicate that, uh, you know, if you are eating more than 22% of your calories, um, from protein, you're going to damage your arteries. You know, this study, it got a lot of attention. It grabbed some headlines. People were talking about it, but here's the thing is, the headlines are written by people looking to grab eyeballs, get clicks. That's not really what these studies showed. And actually, there was two of these studies. So one of them, the first one was done on mice. And all they did was they took these mice that were already um, 
genetically predisposed to have artery problems and fed them a high protein diet. And it activated a certain pathway and they developed arthrosclerosis. Ooh, say that twice uh, <laughs> or three times really fast. So it, it activated this potential, uh, this pathway that was linked to arterial health, but they still can't prove that one caused the other. These mice were already predisposed to have these problems, you know, have cardiovascular disease. So the scientists don't really know if the mechanism is the cause of the cardiovascular disease at this point, is just a theory. So remember, we're talking about mice in this particular study, they did do a follow-up study with humans and they had humans drink a high protein or a low protein meal. And sure enough, in the humans with the high protein, they were doing the high protein, it did activate this particular pathway. But again, there's not an actual direct link between this pathway and our, you know, heart disease, our, our arthrosclerosis. Ugh. I'm going to get that right. Uh, um, you know, and we don't even know if that same pathway is connected in humans like it is in mice. So I, I guess the long and short of it is, you know, hopefully they're going to be doing more studies and everything and actually find out for sure. But you really have to be careful about health related headlines because the people out there, you know, on the news sites and whatever, you know, a lot of them are really just reading, you know, trying to get clicks, trying to get eyeballs. Um, you know, so much of our, our news is, is focused around that these days. Um, and so you really got to do your homework, um, read the studies for yourself. Uh, sometimes they can be a little hard to understand. Just take your time. But you can also, you know, a lot of times like I did, you know, I found somebody who actually broke this down in a lot more readable language and basically said, you know, yeah, that's that headline. It's not what these studies show. Yeah. One of my takeaways is like in any time you're looking at studies, which i like to do, you have to kind of separate like ca causality and correlation, right? right. Like, yep. so one of the first questions is like, okay, you've identified this mechanism or this process, this pathway that, that happens. Okay. Interesting. Is that correlate? Is it a correlation or is it causing this end result? Right. So like you say, <laughs> like arterial damage is caused by protein. Right. It's like, well, that, that isn't quite what this study suggests. <laughs> so, so it's kind of a mislabeling of what this study seems to kind of be pointing to. It's, it's like, Hey, there's, there's some, there, there's this pathway that's happening. Um, we don't really know if it's causal or if it's, uh, correlated right. and, and then you get into the deep weeds. You're like, well, okay, well, these rats had, they were already genetically predisposed to having arterial damage. So it doesn't really tell you. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to see more, but I am glad to see more studies coming out recently, uh, especially on, you know, hyper protein, kind of hyper protein focus, if you will, like, because for, for the longest time, it's been, you know, carbohydrates, low fat, mo very moderate protein. That's right. been generally the kind of consensus and stuff. And like, clearly that's not working. <laughs> right. You know, everybody is getting, you know, heavier, less healthy, you know, and, you know, obviously there, you know, are those of us out there really focusing on these things in our lives. Um, and we're hoping to spread that to a little more of you guys out there, but, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. they're, they're continuing to do studies. There's lots of great information out there. Um, you know, just always do your homework on who you're listening to, what their qualifications are. You know, we'll try to keep you informed as well. Yeah. I would love to see a carnivore, a classic strict carnivore study where it's like just beef, salt, water, how does that, you know, how's that go? All right. We'll get you his contact. Info. If you're out there and want to do this study, we got you a volunteer right that here. That would be awesome. <laughs> All right. We should probably wrap this up. We've been talking for a while. I was going to wrap up with a couple of tips. Um, so here's one from me. If you're starting to do an exercise, you're not you know, really sure. Is it really working? Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? My favorite tip for any given exercise push-ups, bench press, squat is I will Google the name of that exercise and then mistakes. So like push up the mistakes or bench press mistakes. And a lot of times the articles that are about the mistakes you make are written in such a way that for me anyway, it makes things click a lot easier than just how to do a bench press, how to do a push up. You know, the ones that lead to mistakes really t tend to drill down on, you know, the little, you know, niggly things, the little, you know, details that can sometimes make a big difference. So that's my tip for this show. Uh, you got any great tips for us, Steve? 
Oh man, that's a that's a good tip. I typically when I'm training somebody, I will look quite often for parallel. And I think this is actually one of the first conversations we had. We did, yeah. Because um, I look for parallel and perpendicular lines and center of gravity and where the bar path is on their on their body mechanics and stuff. And so what I'm looking for is like smooth motion. And I'm looking for the bar over the center of gravity. And I'm looking for like you know knees, toes, um, and you know upper upper leg femur and all of these things to be like as parallel, straight, you know, similar angle symmetry and things like that. And like things aren't, you know, ankles aren't rolling in. And so I'm, I'm looking at like, I'm kind of looking at lines, right? Because when, when those lines start to break or bend or they're not symmetrical, you start kind of running into problems because your body's going to like, especially if you send a real strong impulse to move that weight, your body's going to do what it, what what you're asking it to do and one way or another yeah yeah and and if it's not all symmetrical parallel perpendicular center you know center mass center gravity and stuff the sheer force is going through certain joints and this and that you you can run into some problems real quick especially like deadlift and squat and stuff where you know if you're if that bar path is is away from you so you can you know that a lot of the the torsion tor or, or torque and, and uh, shear forces and stuff can really really do a number on you. So yeah. I try to look for like you know straight symmetrical. Like a good example would be like when you're squatting, and you you brought up the Olympic lifts, right? Like you're not going to be able to see parallel because the dynamic motion of things, right? But, but ultimately, like if I'm watching somebody from the side, even even on an Olympic lift, like I want to see that I want to see that bar path move in a particular manner so that right. it, it it doesn't get too far away and it doesn't, you know, so depending on their style, you can kind of scoop or whatever, but like it doesn't get so far out of out of way. And then when they catch that bar, you I ideally want to see that line up right over like the middle of their foot. Sure. You know yeah. I mean? So like if they're catching in a snatch or, or front squat position, th those lines are still present, even in a dynamic motion. And, you know, you want to make sure that you're feeling, you know, the muscle is doing the work and that you're not creating a lot of off center, you know, off rotation tension in any of the joints, you know, that's going to cause pain, discomfort, and eventually injury. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Twisting and pulling is not a good, good combo. So you want, you want, you want, all right. So then again, the best way to do that is working with a personal trainer um, like Steve or one of the others in our area who can, you know, give you good advice on, you know, proper exercise form, you know, make sure you're doing it safely and effectively. So again, work with the professionals, folks, whenever, whenever possible. All right. Uh, upcoming events. I, I want to mention, um, it's just a couple days away. We're recording this on the 29th, but on Saturday, uh, the Hornitos Indian Gulch Run is happening here. Um, it's either a two, five, or 10 mile run. Um, and I believe the cost is $35. You can uh, search for this on Facebook. There's an event page that will lead out where you can, uh, you know, join, join that up and pay that. Um, but it should be a really good event in our area. I know you, neither you or I are really big runners. Yeah. Is that uh, a walk run? I think it is. You know, okay, like two mile, I think, yeah. Or totally, I did like so. a, a one mile walk. <laughs> All right. Mm. All right. We're back once again, just here at the end of the show. And of course, have technical glitch number three. Uh, going to have to get these camera overheating issues worked out before our next show, or we're just going to have to talk a little less. I don't know. <laughs> I uh -huh. do talk. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so Steve, getting in touch with you, uh, what's the best way to reach out to you? Yeah. Best way to reach me, Facebook, the, the little coaching page, business page. It's uh, Steve Duggar Coaching. Okay. U-G-G-E-R, Steve Duggar Coaching. All right. Great. So in future shows, we're, uh, we're hoping to have some guests on, uh, you know, business owners, members of our community, you know, other fitness enthusiasts um, who like to come on and uh, chat with us a little bit. So if you'd like to be a guest on the show or sponsor an episode um, or have any questions that you'd like us to try and get answered for you, either from ourselves or a possible guest, you can send an email to show at yosemite.fit um, and that'll get to Steve and I and we'll uh, see if we can't answer that on one of the upcoming shows. And also, if you have any feedback for us, um, on this episode, you know, this is our first one. So whether you want to hear about Olympic lifting or cardio or more diet stuff, supplementation. Yeah. More feedback, the better. That, right. That helps us tremendously where, where you guys want to take things and, yeah. and what you want to hear. So, all right. Well, that's it for this episode. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you found this useful and uh, we will see you on the next show. Steve, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. <laughs>